Thank you, Anton. And War and Peace, you cannot read in one sitting. <laughs> but my book, you can. Um, I just want to thank uh, the owners of Politics and Prose, Bradley Graham and Lissa um, Muscatine, for the invitation to come here tonight. Not everyone gets to speak at this incredible bookstore, so it is really uh, an honor to receive an invitation. And also, Abby Fenwald has helped to organize this event. Um, and it's, it's particularly special for me to be speaking about Tolstoy at Politics and Prose, not just because Politics and Prose is, you know, one of the most, probably the most famous independent bookstore in the country, but also because Politics and Prose is where my cousin Helene, who's sitting in the back row, got me my very first Tolstoy finger puppet. <laughs> and they don't sell them here anymore. And Anton mentioned this to me. And this, was a, this has been a mainstay of my talks on Tolstoy for the past, I don't know, seven or eight years. Uh, uh, so I feel as if we have come home tonight. Um, and in honor of this special event, I'm going to leave him on my finger during the whole talk. <laughs> Just kidding. I'm not going to do that. But he's here for inspiration for all of us. Um, and during Q&A, if you really would like him to be present with me, uh, I'm happy to put him back on my finger. Uh, so one of the first questions I get when people see the cover of this book is, cool picture. Where'd you get the picture? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, exhibit A, my copy of War and Peace. <laughs> this is a book that has been well loved, a book that has been lived through, lived with, struggled with, engaged with, tossed around a bit. Um, Tolstoy and I have been together for almost 25 years. In fact, I met Tolstoy before I met War and Peace. Um, it has been one of the longest relationships of my life. Uh, and as my wife, uh, Corinne, always reminds me when she sees me gently caressing the pages of this book, it has also been one of the most intense relationships of my life. We've had our ups and our downs, Tolstoy and I, that is. Uh, We've had our disagreements, uh, our separations. I even went through a divorce, so I thought it was a divorce. I refused to read a word of, of Tolstoy for a couple of years after graduate school for reasons that I can talk to you about later. But as with any good relationship that lasts, every couple of years or so, I rediscover the reasons that I fell in love with Tolstoy in the first place. And one of those moments came for me in 2009 when I was invited to teach a workshop uh, an hour and a half workshop in a prison, an adult prison, about a short story by Tol Tolstoy called The Death of Ivan Ilyich, a famous short story about a middle-aged guy who contracts a fatal illness and has to come to terms with how, how he's lived his life. Never, have never been to a prison before. I had no idea what to expect. Um, and I will tell you, it was the most powerful teaching experience of my career up to that point. Because this story, not War and Peace, but a smaller one, The Death of Ivan Ilyich, became a vehicle for these men who had read the story, these men who were incarcerated, to share with me decisions that they had made in their own lives, decisions that they perhaps regretted. They shared with me and one another experiences that they've had with death, people that they've watched die. And all of a sudden, a conversation about Russian literature became a conversation about real life. And it struck me that that is what I've always loved about Russian literature and about Tolstoy in particular. The ability of his art, his fiction, to engage an incredibly wide range of people in meaningful, authentic conversation about the things that matter to all of us as human beings. What Russians sometimes call the accursed questions. Who am I? Why am I here? And how should I live? And this is what I've always loved about War and Peace as well. I've read War and Peace maybe 15 times. I haven't been counting, but around 15 times. And each time I read it, it comes alive for me in a new way, which is what a classic does. I mean, a classic is a book that grows with you and changes over time with you. As you change, you have a relationship with it. So each time I've encountered this book, it's a new book. Well, in 2008, I came to see it in an entirely new way again as my family went through a serious financial crisis. Now, I'm not going to give you the details of that crisis. Uh, if you want some of those details, you have to read the book. <laughs> but suffice it to say that it was a serious enough crisis that it felt as if the bottom had dropped out from underneath me. 
some of my most basic assumptions about the world, about myself, about life, were challenged. And I realized, because I was reading War and Peace at the time, why? Because I was finishing another book about Tolstoy back then. That's why I was rereading War and Peace. And suddenly it struck me that this is a book about a society going through a crisis. This book takes place during Russia's wars with Napoleon in the early 1800s. It eventually describes Napoleon's failed inv invasion of Russia in 1812. This is a world in which people's lives are being turned upside down by the forces of war and social change and spiritual confusion. And the question that so many of, of Tolstoy's characters are asking is, how do I find fulfillment and even happiness in such troubled times? Well, that's a question that I was asking very personally back in 2008, as many of us were. And it's a question that many of us are still asking today in 2014. So War and Peace, I realized, is the classic for, for our time. And I also realized that I had to write another book about Tolstoy. That's what this discovery led me to. I was, as I mentioned, I was finishing another book. And I wanted it to be a book about war and peace. I wanted to write a book that would take this massive, intimidating novel of world literature. I can't tell you how many people have said, oh my god, I've tried to start this thing. I can't get through 20 pages. All those characters, all those funny names, or people who are terrified to start the book at all. It's a, it's a shame because this book has such a wealth of wisdom for those of us living today. So what I wanted to do is to take this big, intimidating book and just bring it down to a very human, relatable level. I wanted to guide readers in a very accessible way through the themes, the characters, the historical context of the novel. But even more importantly, I wanted to guide readers through a conversation about the wisdom that this book can offer us on a wide range of topics. And I chose 12 themes. <coughs> These are the titles of my 12 chapters. And I look at them because I always forget one. Um, and the themes are plans imagination, rupture, success, idealism, happiness, love, family, courage, death, perseverance, and truth. So if any of those apply to any of you, that's your book. Um, and in the, in the process of talking about these themes, I don't do it in, a, in an abstract way. I do it by taking readers through the journeys of the characters themselves, because that's what War and Peace does. Um, and at the same time, I interweave the stories from Tolstoy's own life, in which he was grappling with, with many of these same issues and themes. And I also interweave the stories from my own 25-year journey with Tolstoy, because so much of my understanding and thinking about these issues has been shaped in some way by Tolstoy and by War and Peace in particular, a novel which I sometimes jokingly refer to as my secular Talmud. I'm Jewish. <laughs> Um, and then the other aspect of the book that people have appreciated is that as you're moving through Give War and Peace a Chance, you're also moving through the plot of War and Peace. So it's as if uh, it, uh, one phrase I used, which, which my editor and publicist don't like me to use anymore, was it's kind of like a Cliff Notes on steroids. Um, <laughs> but if you don't like that, the way to describe it is that it works well as a companion for those of you reading the book, but it also works well as a standalone book in case you not, don't have plans in the very near future <laughs> to read War and Peace. Everything you need to know for the cocktail party is in this book. <laughs> and of course, I'm being slightly facetious. Um, one of the first chapters I wrote was called Rupture. And that would make sense that that's one of the first chapters, because that was the impetus behind the writing of the book in the first place. And I use the word rupture because it gets at what I was after. Not just crisis, but rupture. When things seem to fall apart, when your most fundamental paradigms about who you are, about what the world is about, no longer hold. Well, these moments of rupture, Tolstoy believed, are also incredible moments of opportunity. For us not only to tap into sources of strength and creativity that we maybe never knew we had, but also to tap into kinds of understanding and insights about the world that we often don't have during more ordinary, smooth flowing times. And a good example of this in the book comes early when the character Nikolai Rostov, who's one of the heroes of the novel, he's still a young man, he's a young aristocratic man, he loses 43,000 rubles at the gambling table. 